Welcome everybody to this panel on what is happening in Cuba, where we try to shed light on the most recent phase of US attempts to roll back the revolution. Uh, the revolution that started 68 years ago today um, with, the uh, with the attack on the Moncada barracks in Santiago de Chile, uh, uh, an event memorialized later by, by Fidel in the name of his July 26 movement. Um, my name is Radhika Desai, and I'm the convener of the International Manifesto Group, which we created as a discussion group at the start of the pandemic to discuss the unfolding of the broad public health, economic, social, political, and international crises that we have been in since the last year or more. Um, certainly at today, our topic concerns the major front of the international crisis. Cuba has been in the forefront of imperialism for the past 72 years. No matter what language it's tricked out in, whether it's about free trade or the civilizing mission or the white man's burden, these racist terms of the past, or in today's language of democracy, human rights, responsibility to protect, etc., imperialism is basically an attempt to open up economies um, and subject entire peoples to economic subordination to metropolitan capital, um, a move which will necessarily deny them the right to development. Cuba has been blockaded ever since the revolution 70 plus years ago, and it has survived nonetheless, and it even survived the fall of the Soviet Union when it lost one of the major supports that it had until that time. Um, Cuba's achievements are not only social in areas like medicine and education, but precisely because of their distinctive social rather than profit-oriented approach to other matters, it, Cuba has also led the field in many technological ways, as we see in vaccines today. Um, in the pandemic, Cuba's deaths per million as of today stand at 205 compared to 1,845 in the United States, nine times higher. And as of course, everybody here should be aware, Cuba has also been uh, developing and providing vaccines to many other countries. Today, imperialism at, is at a new and dangerous state. Ever since the 1990s, when the USSR uh, uh, disintegrated, the United States has been compensating for it, its loss of economic clout, its progressive loss of economic clout, with military and other forms of aggression, hybrid forms of aggression all over the world. Today, with the challenge of China, the United States is getting more desperate. The current attempt to destabilize Cuba, complete with funding from the NED, the Miami groups of uh, uh, encouraging the, op so the opposition in a crisis to, uh, uh, which, to which the US sanctions have made the principal contribution in terms of causing it. Um, and it's prompted, it's, if, if, I, if I read it proper, uh, at all, it's prompted by the need for at least a little victory, given that the big victory against China is bound to prove elusive. Um, the, the 243 sanctions imposed by President Trump in an attempt to turn Florida from a swing state into a red state, and he succeeded. And now Biden is continuing these sanctions and even imposing new ones in a bid precisely to uh, influence, uh, of course, Florida as well. But, but what we have to know is that the Obama era normalization was also in, again, its own form of imperialism because it was prompted by the expectation that the reforms that he had insisted on would turn Cuba capitalist. Uh, just as, for example, in the case of China, the entire period of the late 90s and early 2000s were spent encouraging China and essentially in the expectation of making it capitalist. Um, so, uh, but just as in the case of China, this has not succeeded, it is not going to succeed, I don't think, in Cuba, uh, simply because capitalism actually cannot give people what they need, certainly not in the third world. And today it is increasingly failing to give people what they need, even in the homelands of capitalism in the imperialist metropolitan countries. Um, so, for example, as we saw in Nicaragua, the attempt to try to reverse the revolution succeeded only temporarily because today, again, we have a, a left-leaning government in power. That is why these are some of the reasons why we need to talk about Cuba today. We need to do everything in our power to save Cuba, to let Cuba live. So this is what the panel is about. 
uh, I will introduce Wendy Holm. Um, Wendy is an award-winning Canadian agrologist, resource economist, journalist, and author who's been working with Cuban agricultural cooperatives for 23 years. For, for, for throughout this period, she has taken hundreds of Canadian farmers, chefs, and students to Cuba uh, in 50 separate, seven separate delegations to learn more about Cuban sustainable farming practices. She has organized conferences in Cuba and she has taught a University of British Columbia field studies course on sustainable agriculture from 2005 to 2016. Um, she, she has also worked with St. Mary's University and, uh, and Cuban partner, the National Association of Small Farmers to develop a Cuban version of the co-op index, a diagnostic tool to support farmers cooperatives as Cuba embarks on the road to a more cooperative and people-centered economy. So Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much, Radhika and Arnold for um, your work and everybody else, Claudia and, and, um, and Claude and Keith for putting this together. Um, I'm uh, uh, speaking this morning from Fannie Bay on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish nation. And um, I'm, my role in this uh, session is more and more people have to begin paying attention to what's happening in Cuba. And um, I know that there are some people on this call who probably um, have a great deal of information about Cuba, but there are others who are sort of coming up the learning curve. So my role is to sort of give you a, a, a quick flight over, um, where we are now in Cuba, how we got there, where we started, and the importance of um, today, of course, as the as the um, first shot over the bow of the Cuban Revolution. So I'm going to go through um, sort of the development since uh, 1953 very quickly, a uh, bit of um, history, and then talk a little bit about um, the situation today. So uh, when when um, there were the demonstrations in Havana a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was a, I caught a CNN uh, coverage of it. And uh, they of course did, gave a lot of um, mic time to people in the streets talking about how they had nothing to eat and people were dying and there was no medicine and there was no food and down with the dictator, all the sorts of things that um, will guarantee the, the press will We'll focus on you, and uh, you'll hear more about the uh, engagement of of the United States in in fomenting this dissent and and funding the hip hop community to um, to try and mobilize what appears to be um, uh, a concern on the part of the Cuban people um, against the government. It's concerned with the frustration of the situation they're living in now. Um, but anyway, it was it was um, CNN was covering this story. And uh, standing on another street corner um, were some Cubans holding Cuban flags and uh, standing in defense of, of uh, Cuba and, and of their country. And so the reporter goes over and he says, <clears throat> puts the mic to them and they say, well, this is really, it's not, it, it's the United States and the embargo and, and Trump that has caused the problems that Cuba is uh, facing right now. And <clears throat> the reporter gives them a little bit of mic time and then he turns around and he says to the camera, well, and uh, so you can see there are a few people here who, who disagree with the majority of the protesters. He said, one man even kept repeating to me, I am Fidel, I am Fidel. And he laughed and he said, of course, Fidel has been dead since 2016. I'm so-and-so such and such for CNN in Havana. And I thought, <laughs> oh my God, this man understood nothing about what he was told. Um, the, 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 when, when Fidel passed in 2016 and his funeral cortege went through the countryside from Havana to Santiago de Cuba, where he rests next to Jose, um, Cubans lined the streets in tears. And the expression, yo soy Fidel, I am Fidel, became emblematic of the expression of the Cuban people that even although Fidel was gone, the principles of the revolution, the principles that Fidel fought for and created in this tiny socialist nation um, were within them. They 
kept them within their hearts. And so Fidel would never die. Yo soy Fidel, I am Fidel. And <laughs> this is of course what this man was saying to this reporter who didn't get that at all. So <clears throat> today is, um, is July 26th. Uh, it is the day that the um, first attack on Moncada barracks in 1953. Uh, Fidel named his movement uh, Movimiento de Benti says de Julio, the 26th of July movement. Um, the colors are red and black, you'll notice. And um, it was, uh, it, as you know, Fidel was, uh, was convicted, he was imprisoned, he was um, sent to the, uh, he, uh, there was an amnesty in 1955. So Fidel moved off to Mexico and assembled uh, band of, um, of um, fighters to come back in 1956 on the Granma to launch what became the successful um, Cuban revolution to overthrow the Batista government. And of course, Shea was with uh, Fidel at that time. The, um, the triumph of the revolution, January 1st, 1959, uh, ushered in an entire uh, new uh, nation for Cuba. Cuba had been struggling for independence in the first and second war of independence in the late 1800s. They were under US uh, protectorate and then basically puppet dictatorships. And so 1959 was um, the new dawn for the Cuban people. In um, 1960, it didn't take long, October 1960, the United States placed an embargo on Cuba, which has stood until this day. Cuba um, then turned to the former Soviet Union for support and entered into very important trade agreements with the Soviet Union to support the Cuban economy. Uh, 1961 was declared the year of literacy and young students uh, went off into the countryside to teach farmers and, and people how to read and write. <laughs> and it was the first country in Latin America to be declared free of illiteracy. Um, it is also the year that ANAP, the National Farmers Organization was formed. Um, I better watch my time here. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, ANAP is, is what has brought together the um, farmers into agricultural cooperatives and is the strength of Cuban agriculture. Um, the Bay of Pigs was uh, in 1961, uh, an attempt to, um, to try and, and get back uh, the, or to overthrow the Cuban, or the new revolutionary uh, government. And uh, it was a abysmal failure and the US prisoners were exchanged for baby food. Uh, the 1962 missile crisis, these are the, the, the sort of major things that Americans um, hear about when they hear about Cuba. Well, the missile crisis, uh, there were missiles in Turkey aimed at Moscow. And so Russia put missiles in Cuba aimed at Washington as a standoff. And of course, both of them, both of the, both countries took their missiles away. It wasn't only Cuba who removed missiles. It was the United States who removed the missiles from Turkey. Moving on into the 1980s, um, Cuba had a higher standard of living than uh, the United States based on human development indices. Um, everything in Cuba was, was uh, it was sort of the golden age of Cuba in the 1980s. In the 1990, early 1990, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Cuba was thrown into a period of darkness. Um, it was exacerbated by the collapse of sugar markets in the late 1990s, and Cuba went through what anybody, any other nation would have called a crisis. Cuba called it a special period, and it, uh, the Cuban people lived through that special period. Uh, it was very hard. People our age lost 20, 30 pounds. Um, it was a very difficult time. The Cuban economy had been based principally on sugar. And so with the collapse of the sugar markets, Cuba shut down half her sugar mills and had to look for other sources of income, the Soviet Union gone. And so tourism then became the support for the economy. In 1999, Cuba received the Right Livelihood Award from the Swedish parliament for excellence in organic agriculture. In 2006, Cuba received the World Wildlife Fund Award for the only nation to achieve sustainability based on uh, human development index. Um, 
In 2008, Raul replaced um, Fidel when Fidel stepped down because of illness. And Raul, um, so Fidel was the older brother and Fidel was the, the leader, follow me. Raul, I think, in my opinion, was he ran the army for many years. If you don't, if you're not a good listener, you, that doesn't work well. So he was a listener and he had a different approach than Fidel. Fidel was follow me and Raul was tell me what the problems are. So Raul um, and the Cuban government, of course, uh, went out to the Cuban people and said, we need to, um, we need to renovate socialism to work with the new global economy. How do we do this? How do we make the policy changes that are necessary for for Cuba? What are the things that what are the things that you want to see? Where what are the problems? What are your complaints? I want to know everything that you feel is wrong or want changed uh, in your community, at your local bodega, in your schools, in your life. And the Cuban people went, really, really, really? You want to know all the problems? Okay, here are the problems. And so tons of of in, through their through their CVRs through their mass organizations, Cubans put on the desk of the Cuban government all the things that they wish to see changed, and Los Lineamientos was then drafted and sent back to the people. These were the policy guidelines for the new Cuban economy and society. And people again had the opportunity to look and talk and and pick over these and comment and send their comments back to the government. This is, <clears throat> as a policy economist, to me, this is an unprecedented process uh, that uh, I, on a policy level that um, I think is a hugely admirable one and I have never seen it any place else, that level of consultation. So Los Lineamientos were implemented in 2011. It opened up uh, brand new opportunities for cooperatives. It opened up brand new opportunities for Cuenta Propistas. And uh, the Cuban economy, um, I mean, the, the difference was, was very evident for those of us who go to Cuba a lot. Um, there were uh, all sorts of new enterprises and things were going very, very well. In 2016, uh, Obama visits Cuba, and of course, in 2016 as well, uh, sadly, uh, Fidel passed away. The big, second big problem, uh, of course, was Trump. In 2017, Trump comes in, uh, and the, as Radica mentioned, the um, the uh, restrictions, I mean, Title III of the Helms-Burton Act was uh, enacted, which gave extraterritorial jurisdiction, the right of, of uh, anybody who felt aggrieved to sue companies who were doing business in Cuba. Um, there was a ban on all cruise ships. There was a ban on commercial airlines. There was a ban placed on charter flights. There was a discontinuation of the people to people program. There was a blockading of, of uh, of ships trying to sell oil to Cuba. There was banks that were sanctioned, international banks sanctioned for anybody who was gonna do any commercial business with Cuba. They stopped, uh, Trump stopped remittances from the US, which was a three and a half billion dollar hit to the Cuban economy. Um, they pushed to kill, uh, uh, pushed countries who were using the services of Cuban doctors to stop using the services of Cuban doctors. Brazil, for example, was one that cut 6.3 billion off the uh, inputs for the Cuban government. And um, with all of these sanctions in place, more and more and more and more and more, then comes COVID and COVID crashes the Cuban economy built on tourism. Like the special period, it is worse because in the special period, mostly everyone was still working for the state. Now, people had left, started their own businesses, Quinta Propistas. Um, many people were, were in small private enterprise. And so they were not no longer employed by the state. They were completely out of work and are out of work right now. The, um, the, the frustration in Cuba, I speak to my friends on a weekly basis, is, um, is very high. But the frustration is with the embargo, the Trump sanctions and COVID, the those are the things that are killing the Cuban uh, economy right now or putting it under very great pressure. Um, so there's gonna be a lot more spoken or discussed with you with the other speakers on going digging deeper into these um, areas. But basically Cuba is a leader in uh, sustainable agriculture. It is doing important work in cooperatives. Um, 
somebody said to me, well, that's a bit of an experiment, isn't it socialism? And I said, well, actually capitalism is the experiment and capitalism is, you know, lying bleeding on the global floor right now. We've seen the problems with capitalism and capitalism is a failed system. We need the cooperatives of Cuba. We need the approach of socialism. We need the people-centered economy. Um, socialism fears, ca capitalism fears socialism, so it gaslights it and calls it communism, trying to bring up the, the, the fear of people. And, um, and I think the, there was a house appropriations bill, uh, 20 million to democratize Cuba. Um, I wanna close with a quote that I heard uh, or that was was uh, on the news recently, Miami Republican Mayor Francis Suarez talks about the false promise of, of socialism. The truth of the matter is it's never worked and never going to work. And the United States has to start intervening and finding a way, whether it's through humanitarian aid, military intervention, whatever means necessary to protect the sovereignty of the Cuban people and the sovereignty of the United States in this hemisphere. I think that's shocking and it is, it is exactly what is underpinning all of the aggression that you're seeing towards Cuba today. We need to stand up for Cuba at the end of this webinar. You'll have a couple of links of very important things that you can take five minutes and do that will add to the voice that is speaking up for our friend Cuba. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. That was uh, really quite a, a detailed, I think, uh, uh, understanding of just really what's possible in socialism. And this is a message we need to really get across, particularly when more and more people are realizing what a useless system capitalism is. Um, our next uh, speaker is Keith Bolander. Keith is an award-winning journalist and author on US-Cuba relations. He has written a number of works, including Voices from the Other Side, Cuba Under Siege, and Manufacturing the Enemy, the Media War Against Cuba. Brilliant title, I thought. He's written extensively for the, uh, on Cuban issues for the Toronto Star, The Guardian, The Florida Sun Sentinel, The Council for Hemispheric Affairs, The North American Council on Latin America, Monthly Review, Progresso Weekly, and Progresso Weekly. He's a lecturer, he has lectured on US-Cuba relations throughout uh, North America and Europe, including the United uh, Kingdom, um, at the United Nations, at the European Union, and the Scottish National Parliament. He's a member of the Institute for Public Accuracy, and he's on their roster as an expert on Cuban affairs. So Keith, the floor is yours. Thank you, Radhika, and uh, welcome everyone uh, to the conference. I'd like to thank uh, Radhika Arnold and the others for inviting me to speak here. Um, so we all know that the recent protests in Cuba have generated a tremendous amount of international attention in both the traditional and social media and within political circles, particularly in the United States. So today I'm gonna to focus in on how corporate media has covered the protests. Uh, not surprisingly, the media coverage has been consistently terrible. Uh, this is really not unexpected. For the past 60 years, uh, corporate media in the United States mainly, but elsewhere has consistently functioned as the propaganda arm for America's hostile regime change policies. Consistently framing Cuban coverage in the most negative terms, creating narratives that are simply misinformed, biased, and factually incorrect. Those conditions revealed themselves once more in how the protests in Cuba reported and, and how the media interpreted them. The focus on the protests from the media were entirely from the anti-government angle. Lots of coverage of the minority of protesters shouting anti-government slogans. Some mention of the food shortages, COVID, and the economic problems. A great deal of commentary about government security repressing all the protesters instead of reporting the arrests were made against those committing violent acts. There was also ample coverage about how rare protests are in Cuba and that they're illegal, which is simply not true. 
Uh, on the other side, of course, there was no recognition of the American blockade, the harm it does, nor the negative influence it has on the economic conditions that led to the protests. The only references were to deny the effects of the blockade. And there was a lot less reporting of the much larger pro-revolutionary demonstrations in the following days. When there was coverage, it was often diminished or denigrated or simply denied as in the case noted by uh, Wendy earlier of the CNN reporter just not understanding when the Cuban man in support of the government said, you know, soy fidel. Uh, I, think that, uh, I think that ignorance is intentional as it reinforces America's perception that any Cuban who still supports the government must be crazy. Uh, corporate media consistently misinterprets the Cuban voice to want improvement, but without Please. foreign interference. Um, it's Please, if part I may of the regime briefly. change strategy that purports the Cuban people are simply desperate to rid themselves of their government and that the Americans will be the ones who will come in and save them. Um, and we all have a recent examples of how well that turned out in other countries. So okay. protests against the economic difficulties Cuban face have a certain legitimacy, as even Cuban President Diaz-Canal acknowledged, as are concerns of any inappropriate government reaction against peaceful protesters and the treatment of those arrested. Yeah. Uh, Keith, um, Keith, just one second. Yes. Um, we cannot hear you very well. It's it's sort of the 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 connection is Sorry, not very I can't good. Hear you. The connection is not very good. So if you could turn Sorry, off I your can't, video, I, I didn't understand what you're saying, Radhika. Please check the message. Yeah. Okay, that's better. Now please continue. Okay. Right. Let me let me stop the video and, and see that. And see if that improves. Yeah, the video is stopped now. Is that better? Yes. Maybe my my internet connection seems strong, but maybe it's just the the access. Is that is that better? Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, perfect. So I'll I'll, I'll carry on um, from from the situation where the, the uh, where where the uh, the Yosef Fidel comment that uh, Wendy referred to. Um, it, it, it reinforces the ignorance of the CNN reporter, reinforces America's perception that any Cuban who still supports a government must be crazy. Can you hear me now, all right, Radhika, is that fine now? So, so uh, corporate media consistently misinterprets the Cuban voices who want improvement, but without foreign interference. It's part of the regime change strategy. Um, so the protests against the economic difficulties Cubans face have a certain legitimacy as even Cuban President Diaz-Canal acknowledged, as are concerns of any inappropriate government reaction against peaceful protesters and the treatment of those arrested. But there is as much legitimacy to pro-government rallies and support and the demands to end the U.S. blockade. However, when the corporate media covers only one side to create the narratives that the whole country is ready to throw off the revolution, and ignores or tries to delegitimize the much larger support for Cuban independence, then that media is simply a willing tool for America's imperial designs. And those, are, and those designs are, are based on the efforts to make things so bad for the Cuban people that they'll overthrow their own government. These protests in Cuba are exactly how American regime change strategy is supposed to work. So here's some examples of the corporate media. NBC News ran a blaring headline, Are protests the beginning of the end for Cuba's communist government? The article went on to speculate that if more anti-government protests were held, it could spell the end of the government. There was no reporting of the far greater public demonstrations of support. And did NBC promote the same narratives in the far more extensive and violent protests in other countries like Colombia Haiti or Ecuador? Of course not. Protests around the world are not framed primarily in ideological terms, only when they happen in Cuba. Two days ago, protests throughout Australia against the current COVID lockdowns and against restrictions of liberty 
resulted in dozens of arrests and incidents of violence. So did the corporate media call for the end of the Australian form of government? We all know the answer to that. So this is an evidence in both media and political circles. Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mark Gano, released a tweet last week criticizing Cuba's violent crackdown on peaceful protesters and journalists. His unwarranted comments came despite the evidence that the vast majority of the protests were peaceful and that state authorities reacted with arrests and detentions only against the small number of protesters who were damaging property, including the hospital in Matanzas. To suggest the government was violent against the peaceful protesters is a lie promoted by media and parroted by the politicians. Incredibly, back in May, Garneau issued a statement on the ongoing protests against the right-wing government in Colombia where security forces there have injured hundreds, killed dozens, and arrested unknown num numbers. While acknowledging state repression, in his statement then, Garneau laid equal blame on the Colombian protesters for their violence against property and police. He made no mention of Cuban protesters damaging property or attacking the police in Cuba. This hypocrisy is common, but it remains astounding. And unfortunately, Canada is following in line with anti-Cuban propaganda. Here's another example. The BBC showed remarkable self-discipline in determining what their readers should understand about the Cuban protests when they ran an article listing three things that were responsible. Number one, the food shortages. Number two, the COVID situation. And number three, the limitations of the internet in Cuba. How they missed number four, the devastating impact of America's blockade and regime change policies, well, you can only miss it if you want your audience to give it to no, if you want your audience to give it no consideration. One of the most am amazing exchanges, which, which went, Wendy mentioned, came when the right-wing folks at uh, Fox News gave time to Miami Mayor Frances Suarez to call for the U.S. to bomb Cuba in response to the protests. The suggestion did not elicit any challenge from the reporter, who apparently thought it was something not so totally ridiculous to consider. The New York Times did its part to convince its readers that the increased American restrictions against Cuba played little role in the protests. In their article July 11th, quote, in a country known for repressive crackdowns on, dis on dissent, the rallies were widely viewed as astonishing, end quote presenting the movement as a laudable action against an authoritarian government. Only at the end of the article did it mention the increased sanctions that current President Biden has done nothing to end. And even when they mentioned the sanctions, they noted that it was the Cuban government claiming the blockade was doing harm, letting the reader dismiss the embargo's impact as simply unfounded complaints by the Cuban leadership. So devoting such little time to the blockade relegating it to the final paragraphs and then framing them as accusations rather than facts as the result of conveying that the blockade has little importance, as the Washington Post did in its editorial July 12th, claiming that the Cubans blame everything on the embargo for all their economic problems. However, when the media and politicians insist the embargo has no impact, they can never answer the question, if it doesn't have any effect, then why is it still there? But even when the media covers a pro-Cuban story, they have to insert irrelevant negative qualifiers. Just on Saturday, Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador complimented Cuba as an example of resistance and proposed the entire country should be declared a World Heritage Site, as well as criticizing the American-controlled OAS. The Associated Press story couldn't resist questioning if Obrador was serious in his praise then added the ridiculously unrelated comment that, quote, much of Cuba seems stuck technologically in the middle of the last century, end quote. I guess to reinforce the average American's ill-informed perception of the country. To make sure there was more anti-Cuban content, the story also included the lie that the street protests were violently repressed by the Cuban government. There was no repression, only arrests of those committing violence. I really don't have time to mention many more, many more other examples, but I do want to comment on the number of corporate media outlets who published photos of pro-government rallies and claimed they were evidence of anti-government protesters. 
Intentionally or not, it demonstrated just how biased corporate media is against Cuba. If they can't even get the pictures right, why believe the words? The Guardian, Fox News, Boston Globe, Financial Times, Yahoo News, NBC Today were among those that used an image of masses of government supporters gathering in central Havana and falsely claimed they were part of anti-revolutionary demonstrations. Anyone with an even basic knowledge of Cuba seeing the giant red and black flies, flags emboldened with the words 26 Julio, which is Fidel Castro's political movement, that should have been a dead giveaway. CNN even went so far as to use a photo of a rally in Miami to promote an article headlined, Cubans take to the street in rare anti-government rally. I mean, it can't be that hard to tell the difference between Miami and Havana. As said before, there are reasons for Cubans to protest. Food shortages, economic difficulties, the serious increases in COVID cases that are keeping the country in lockdown. But for corporate media to ignore or downplay the important role U.S. regime change policies have in making things so much worse for the population, which is exactly the purpose of the blockade, is to demonstrate how far media will go to ensure misinformation and lies remain the standard for coverage of the Cuban revolution. All based on the hostility corporate for-profit media has against Cuban socialism and the economic system it works under. The protests also represent exactly how American regime change policies are supposed to work. As officially noted, since the 1960s, U.S. strategy has been to decrease monetary and real wages to bring about hunger, desperation, and the overthrow of the government. Even during the pandemic, the United States policy has been to make things worse when Cuba is at its most vulnerable. That's why mainstream media and the politicians are trying to take advantage of the protest to promote the idea that the protests represent the end of the revolution. It isn't and it doesn't. And while social media play, played an important role in coordinating the protests under American interference, it is the mainstream media that retains the widest audience and most influence in shaping the misinformation and bias against Cuban society and its people all in support of America's regime change objectives. Coverage of the protest is just the latest example of how dishonest and manipulative the mainstream corporate media is when it comes to Cuba. It continues to shape the average person's ill-informed and inaccurate opinions of revolution and the people who support Cuba's right to independence. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Keith. I think that was a really great analysis of um, really the structure and contradictions of imperialist discourse about Cuba and other such countries. Um, okay, before introducing the next speaker, I just have a couple of uh, practicalities. Firstly, thank you to all those who reminded us that we did not do a land acknowledgement, so I would like to do one. Uh, I am uh, at least, and the, this event is being hosted from the stolen lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the OG Cree, Dakota and the Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis nation. Um, I would also like to draw people's attention to the chat where I and also my uh, colleague, my friend and colleague Tamara Hansen have been posting the petitions that Wendy mentioned. Please take a minute to sign them. There's one that is uh, for Canadians. It's a parliamentary petition and there's another international petition for those of you who are not uh, in Canada or are not Canadian. So please take a look and sign. Okay, so our next speaker is Arnold August. And I should say that Arnold August is the sort of motivating spirit behind this panel. He's the one who said, let's have one and, and, and really did all the work of putting together. And most of you will probably know Arnold August as a Montreal based author and journalist. Uh, who has written three uh, very important books on Cuba, Democracy in Cuba in the 1997-98 elections, Cuba and its neighboring democracy in motion, sorry, Cuba and its neighbors democracy in motion, um, and Cuba-US uh, relations. And his books have been praised as, as exceedingly accurate and accounts and very forceful accounts of um, uh, of the US-Cuba relations and what's going on in Cuba. Um, He's, his, and his works have been published in English, Spanish, fr and French in North America, South America, Europe, and the Middle East. So Arnold, please take the floor. 
Thanks for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I am speaking from Montreal in the, on the uh, grounds of Canyon Keha Nation. Uh, I'll be focusing uh, directly on social media. A part of my uh, presentation today, 14 minute presentation today, is based on an expert analysis analyst in Spain, whose name is um, uh, Macias Tovar, Julian Macias Tovar from Spain, quoting from the original Spanish. He says, the operation made intensive use of bots and new accounts recently created for the occasion, intending to make a chorus for SOS Cuba. But what is a bot? A bot is a software application that runs automated scripts over the internet. Typically, Ta bot tasks are simple and repetitive, much faster than a person could tweet. New accounts, get this, more than 1,500 of the accounts that participated in the operation with the hashtag SOS Cuba was created between July 10th and 11th. Now, the first account that used the hashtag SOS Cuba was located in Spain. It posted more than a thousand tweets on July 10th and 11th with automation of five tweets, not per minute, five tweets per second. Tovar from Spain analyzed the more than 2 million tweets using the hashtag SOS Cuba that started asking for humanitarian aid given increasing COVID deaths in Cuba with the participation of artists and thousands of newly created accounts and bots produce this produce mobilization in the streets. Tover points out that the campaign were carried out specifically geared to artists to participate with a, the hashtag tweet SOS Cuba. Now the recent question of artists is important in Cuba. Recent history, the San Isidro movement of so-called artists started to take place last year during the Trump administration. Their slogans were quite simple, pro-Trump, financed by the US with logistic, logistical support of the American embassy in Havana. Their slogans are very complicated, vote Trump and vote Cuba. Now, this orientation by the artists last year, did this stop Biden? No. On March 12, 2021, under Biden, Julie Chung, as Assistant Secretary of State, recently met with the San Isidro movement activists. She, she said, quoting, quoting, we enjoyed an open exchange of views on free expression, assembly, media, and culture. We heard about the San Isidro movement. Thank you. We salute Cuba's brave champions of democracy and human rights. End of the quote. Now, the first demonstration in San Antonio de los Baños was publicized, not in Cuba. The first one was published in the United States by the account of one person named Yusnabi with thousands of retweets. As Tover, this Spanish analyst mentions, curiously, Yusnabi, Yusnabi, by the way, is a Latin American pronunciation as U.S. Navy. So he uses really the U.S. Navy Hashtag disguised as something Latino. Is the Tover says this account comes out by far the most in his threads because it is one of the patterns of automated fake accounts that sp spread hoaxes and hate campaigns. So I was curious, this guy uh, used Bani. I, investig I investigated him on my own a couple of days ago. Here it is. His real name is Eduardo Yusnabi Perez. Born in Cuba, but of course, he went to the United States. Soon as he arrived in the United States, he got a paid job as a journalist with Cubanet, which is a dissident, dissident uh, outlet financed by the CIA's National Endowment for Democracy. And he also landed a job with Univision. Based in the US, the main, uh, the main uh, focus there is to disinform people all across Latin America in, in Spanish. Now, so far we have seen United States, Spain, how they are involved. Also from Argentina. 
Now, this is important. The Argentina, uh, this is uh, Tovar explaining this. The Argentine uh, uh, Agustin Antonetti, this person, he is part of the right wing Fundacion Libertad. Antonet, Antonetti has been an active participant in the campaigns of hoaxes and bots and social networks against left wing governments in Latin America, among them against President Evo Morales and Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. And of course, yesterday he did not miss the occasion by attacking Lopa, Lopez Obrador for his position in defense of Cuba. Now, in the, his account profile of this Argentine activist is emblazoned SOS Cuba. So we have United States, Spain, and Argentina together resulting on July 11th, the protest that broke out with hundreds of thousands of tweets and the partition, particip, participation of many artist accounts. The hashtag became a global trend in several countries. That is why the presentation by Keith is important. He shows how the international media took the uh, trend topic that is restrained mainly to, to Twitter account, they converted that into international media, television, mainstream media, all across the world. They made it visible to millions of people across the world, whether they had a Twitter account or not. Now, there's an important issue people are discussing. Well, who participated aside from the core hashtag SOS Cuba in, in, in Cuba? Yesterday, I spoke by telephone with uh, a colleague of mine who was a journalist involved in analyzing social media. He is a real expert. Here's, here's the latest figures. Internet on the island. Smartphones, 54.3% of, of people uh, having smartphones have access to the internet. Social media, 55.5% participate in social media such as Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and Facebook. So you see that there is that whole uh, that situation there. And I, I also asked my colleague yesterday uh, on internet, sort of playing the devil's advocate. I asked, well, do you think that this is the expansion of internet is a double-edged sword? Well, he answered the following way. He knew exactly what, it, uh, what I was getting at. He said, it can, I quote, it can be said that although internet access has increased, this is very positive, it also has a negative effect of providing for the counter-revolution access to the population, especially to the young people. He is referring to a section of the youth only, only a section. This uh, coincides with my own experience. In 2018, 2019, they gave a series of lectures to university students in Havana and other cities in, in, in Cuba. It was really uh, very encouraging to see these youth so clear on the issue of imperialism, making no distinction between Obama and Biden or Bush before in the sense that all American presidents have this basic goal of subverting the Cuban revolutions as, previ uh, as uh, previous speakers have mentioned. And they we even discuss very touching topics, such as is there such a thing as uh, of, uh, in the Cuban culture of being naive about uh, certain uh, individuals such as Obama? It was really inspiring to see how these people have no uh, illusions at all about the United States. But I was still struggling with this last night. How to present it this to you today? Because it is a complicated situation. So. I found a, 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 a perspective direct from Cuba in the Cuba, de, Cuba Debati website, which is not officially a Cuban uh, outlet, but of course it supports the revolution. This article last night, which impressed me so much, was written by uh, Fabian Escalante. He's well known. I'm sure Claude and others know about him. He's a major general, a former head of the Cuban intelligence services. He is the author of several books on the US intelligence service activities against Cuba and has investigated the assassination of John F. Kennedy from the Cuban prison. 
So his views are important. Allow me to share with you certain aspects roughly translated from Spanish. Undoubtedly, he says, the social explosion, notice he uses the word social explosion in much of the mainstream Cuban media, they do not use the word social explosion. Undoubtedly, the social explosion that occurred in our country on July 11 of this year su surprised us all and not for lack of evidence and indications. Today's Cuba, he went on to say, and the world is different from yesterday's and even more different from that of the first years of the revolution. The reasons that make it impossible to use the same methods of analysis of crisis management used before. There is a young, he said, a young depoliticized sector of the population due to our inefficient political and patriotic, patriotic work that does not understand the need for resistance to imperial policy and wants to just want to improve their living, living condition, but does not find an immediate solution to their expectations. So he, is, he continues to write, the days have passed since the events reported, and as it happens, many interpretations come to the fore, this is true. While the media campaigns in the United States and its allies continue to blatantly accuse Cuba of human rights violations and other uh, atrocities with the open intention to create the condition for a U.S. military invention. He should know about U.S. military inventions. We revolutions, he said, have to meditate and gather experiences about the events that have taken place. He's being very realistic. The United States and its fascist government are the main responsible, but, and this is important, we also have responsibility, we the Cubans, for the mistakes made, which require a self-critical analysis, not only marginal references. It is necessary, he said, to delve into why mistakes took place. For example, the influence amongst the youth, what were its causes and how we are going to solve them. Now, reading uh, Escalante, what he said about youth, one thing came to mind, uh, is that I, I did a lot of work and wrote a lot. I have these in my books. The 2016 uh, Obama offensive uh, when he came to Cuba uh, in 2016. With Obama came a whole slat, a whole series of, uh, of individuals. For example, Rolling Stones, Rihanna, parts of Havana occupied by the filming of Fast and Furious, even the Channel Vision fashion show also occupied part of Havana. So we see even on the Cuban press and all that, uh, Cuban youth running after these events. And I think in my view, these events instilling in the minds of the Cuban youth, individualism and consumerism, and certainly not helping the, the, the cause of pride in Cuba's sovereignty and its own system social system. So in conclusion, I really have only one certain conclusion. That is, the, what was organized in July 11th was from abroad. The, the core organizing organization was from abroad. It was not a spontaneous domestic uh, uh, activity. I was proud to have contributed in a very minor way to an article uh, called The Bay of Tweets written by Aaron, Alan McLeod of Mint Press. Bay of Tweets is, is pretty good. I mean, I think uh, 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 it was uh, the first speaker, Wendy, mentioned the Bay of Pigs. Well, as far as I'm concerned and others, that offensive by the social media leading up to July 11th was sort of another Bay of Tweets uh, um, uh, invasion. Now, every, as far as I'm concerned, everything else is still up in the air. Who participated aside from the SOS Cuba agitators? Was it massive? Was it completely negligible? I would say neither. The situation is still unfolding. For example, just yesterday, I quoted that article from Escalante. There, will, there have been other similar ones before, and there will be more in the coming days and weeks. It is not just an issue of numbers. I spoke to another 
friend of mine in Havana very late last night. I was putting finishing touches to this presentation, and he had a view which is different than Escalante. He said, regarding those people who participated uh, along with the SOS Corps, SOS Cuba uh, Corps was, and he quoted, disparity. Those who were in the, those demonstrations, because no matter how much one is upset with things, we cannot do anything that hands over the country to the Yankees on a silver platter. End of quote from my friend late last night. So Cuba, this thing in Cuba is still going on. The way I see it, Cuba, like Venezuela, is still an ongoing struggle. For example, just last Saturday, Trudeau's government, by its uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mark Garneau, uh, issued a statement against, I think this was mentioned by others as well, a crackdown in, uh, in, in Cuba. Now, if you Google the word crackdown, two words, Google and crackdowns in Cuba, you will see how many times it shows up. So Trudeau and his government are contributing to the overall narrative against Cuba uh, under the uh, cover of uh, crackdowns and repression and all that. Now, Trudeau, so he seems to be in an indirect manner providing support for the so-called protest against the government. Now, Trudeau has a history. How many people know when he visited Cuba in November 14, 2016, he met with dissidents. These dissidents he met then in July 11, directly or indirectly support the protesters against the government. So in finishing, allow me to say, Trudeau should rather change course and take into account a petition deposited in the Canadian parliament asking him to call on Biden to uh, lift the blo blockade. Sign that. And another positive note, last night my friend also said, I think Putin slapped Biden in the face with the dispatch of two planes loaded with aid by express order of Putin. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Arnold. That was great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will now um, I will now introduce our next speaker. Claudia Chauvin is a, a medical doctor originally from Argentina, and she is at the moment associate professor of health policy at York University in Toronto. She researches the geopolitical economy of global health and is actively involved in organizations working on anti-war, anti-colonial, and anti-imperialist struggles. So Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Radic, and thank you everyone for coming today and uh, both uh, Radic and Arnold for organizing this wonderful panel uh, of scholars and activists with decades of joint collective um, experience with a knowledge of Cuba. Uh, I claim very few credentials uh, other than having received my medical degree at the same school of medicine where um, Ernesto Che Guevara received his in 1953 plus some half a dozen trips to Cuba over the last decade and of course studying Cuba, et cetera, that helped me to develop a reasonably good understanding of its people, its history and uh, the current conjuncture. Now we met before the panel to more or less organize and try to not sort of overlap each other's topics, but uh, to some degree uh, there will be some overlap. So please bear with me. Uh, I was uh, decided that I would talk about hybrid warfare and about the effect of sanctions on the day-to-day -day life of the Cuban people. So that's what I will do. So why hybrid warfare? Well, there's a long-standing debate around what counts as hybrid warfare. And this, this is kind of a topic that has been addressed more or less by other panelists, uh, indirectly even, right, with different names whether it is a new or an old way of waging war and so on. Now, for the sake of time, let me offer a fairly representative definition from a recent article in an outlet that popularizes academic and scientific research, uh, largely dedicated to the Anglophone world. It's called The Conversation. And the authors in this article describe hybrid warfare, and I more or less quote, a mixture of conventional and unconventional methods used by weak political actors, be it states, groups, or individuals, 
against the stronger adversary. Now, the author expands that hybrid warfare, and I quote again, aims to achieve political objectives that would not be possible with traditional warfare, meaning you know, military uh, means of force. They elaborate that while traditional warfare is waged by enemies belonging to nation states, uh, by, I'm sorry, by armies belonging to nation states, so it's a clash between armies, right? Unconventional warfare, hybrid warfare being a type of unconventional warfare involves manipulating public opinion to wage war. For instance, funding by funding opposition groups, inciting social unrest, preying on existing grievances and so on, to undermine the legitimacy of political leaders. Now, revealingly, they offer their definition as they describe what they believe is the type of warfare waged against the United States by a country that the West loves to hate. Uh, it's not China, it's Russia, in case you wonder. At any rate, today, I would like to make the case that it is not the weak, but rather the strong, and especially the US, that increasingly, since the collapse of the socialist camp, has waged relentless and vicious hybrid warfare against any country, nation, or people, large and small, that stands in the way of Western hegemony. Beginning with the so-called age of mass democracy, the hegemonic West can no longer rely on naked colonial and imperial conquest. Even the settler colonial capitalist Canadian state constantly showcases its efforts to decolonize. So former colonial powers must appeal to forms of domination that rely on manipulating public opinion, subverting diplomatic efforts, and imposing economic sanctions on anyone who refuses to toe the line. Now, hybrid warfare is the kind of warfare that the US has waged against the people of Cuba, uh, alongside military means, of course, since the revolution to this day, one in which sanctions play a key role by making the economy scream. Now, the strategy of making the economy scream is not new, and the US is really good at it thanks to decades of practice. To mention just one case closer to home, like literally closer to home, right across Argentina, uh, in the 1970s, the US made Chile's economy scream to protect the Chilean people from their own bad choices. The US backed assault against Chile culminated in 1973 in what is sometimes called the first 9 11. With a weakened economy and its capital bombed, the socialist project led by Chilean President Salvador Allende ended, and a 17 year, old, year long savage military regime ensued of which Chile has yet to fully recover. Now, with a similar goal in mind, the US engaged in hybrid warfare against Cuba. And people have already mentioned this, but let me just uh, very quickly recapitulate. Its first attempt to make the Cuban economy scream less than two years after the revolution, when US elites realized that the revolutionary leadership was not for sale and really meant the social, political, and economic changes it had promised the Cuban people. Every now and then, the effects of US sanctions and the well being of Cubans capture Western attention. But sanctions do not affect Cubans every now and then. Rather, they are part of their daily predicament. And anybody who goes to Cuba can actually see that. We saw a glimpse of this predicament, albeit co opted by Western intervention, on Sunday, July 11. The current US sanctions are often called embargo likely because embargo sounds less aggressive than sanctions, and sanctions have often been also compared to siege warfare, which historically is a really, really brutal form of total war against civilians, and not just the military, but also civilians. Now, but whatever the labels, their impact on the well-being of Cubans is equally brutal. And this is because the sanctions not only forbid US businesses from trading with Cuba, they also impose severe penalties on anyone anywhere in the world engaging with Cuba. And at least until now, US sanctions have had the power to make it extremely unpleasant and virtually in practice impossible for any nation or company to conduct trade with Cuba. Because defying US wrath leads to the loss of trade with a huge US market, not to mention the financial penalties given the grip that the US has over the global banking system. Now, so how exactly do these sanctions affect the day-to-day -day, day -day life of my Cuban people? Now, 
Uh, my team and I have a small group of very enthusiastic students. We're conducting a very thorough literature review, like a very standard literature review on the health effects of sanctions that virtually all of them obtain their effects on the people of Cuba. I will focus just on one basic human need and social determinant of health, as we call it in the health policy community, food. A key goal of the US sanctions regime, not only against Cuba, but also against Syria, Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, the list is very long, is and has always been to keep ordinary people hungry so that they eventually rise up against their own leaders. And Cuba is no exception. So right after the revolution from 1962 to the year 2000, the US banned the sale of food to Cuba. Although through the 1990s, as other speakers have mentioned, Cuba was able to offset the ban with the support of the socialist camp. When the socialist camp disintegrated, the support ended. And it was then in 1992 that the United States, smelling blood, implemented the Torricelli Act. The sinister name of this act, as you probably know, is the Cuban Democracy Act. And in 1996, the Helms-Burden Act, also sinisterly called, Liberty Act, imposing economic sanctions that dramatically tightened the existing blockade. Now, Cuba lost 80% of its in export market at the time and imports fell by 80%, so that essentially the economy collapsed, leading to a period of malnutrition on a grand scale, the so-called special period. Now, while in the year 2000, the US created an exemption allowing certain sales of food, it has since forced Cuba to pay cash in advance for all US imports, making these imports all but inaccessible in practice. Now, as a result, Cuba has to purchase food from any country that has the courage and power to defy US wrath. Yet given the distances with these supporting countries, the additional costs for Cuba amount to hundreds of millions of dollars annually that burden an already strained economy. Now, to a substantial degree, due to the sanctions, much of Cuba's arable land also remains uh, uncultivated, or at least cultivated much less than it otherwise would be or could be. Not because of shortage of labor or lack of will on the part of Cuban farmers to grow food for their own people. You can actually talk to them if you visit Cuba, and they're really, really eager to do that and achieve food self-sufficiency but rather because of the lack of supplies for agriculture, machinery, parts, seeds, fertilizers, etc. There are at least four additional ways in which sanctions affect the social determinants of health of the Cuban people. Very briefly, they affect access to medical services and supply, access to proper housing, given the lack of construction material, and even if nobody's homeless in Cuba, housing can be crowded and in disrepair and access to income, just cash. For instance, very few banks process Cuban transactions. Remittances from relatives abroad have become increasingly difficult to send to Cuba. Tourism, as other people have mentioned from the US, which could benefit, or other places of course, which benefit the Cuban economy is extremely uh, restricted as uh, especially those who reside in the land of the free are not free to visit Cuba. The tightening of sanctions in 2019 by the Trump administration hit the energy sector especially hard, specifically the supply of oil. Now, even if oil was not coming to Cuba from the United States, but from other jurisdictions, faced with the US wrath again, those who would happily supply oil to Cuba often decide that the cost is simply too high. Now, you may wonder, what is the point of all this cruelty which incidentally has been opposed over the last 20 years increasingly by more and more countries, all of them in the planet except for two. Well, Israel and the United States. Well, the stated purpose of Cuban sanctions is to pressure the Cuban government to abandon the tyranny of communism and move towards democracy and respect for human rights, as all these are quoted. Almost embarrassingly, Canada allegedly shares this concern. According to a recent communication from Global Affairs Canada, when Minister Garneau met his Cuban counterpart, Bruno Rodriguez Padilla, Garneau expressed, I quote, concern over the repressive measures against peaceful protesters, stating that the people of Cuba Could deserve democracy. Soon, Claudia. Yes, I'm about to wrap up. I have one minute to go. 
and told the Cuban official that Canada calls for the rights of the Cuban people to be respected. Now in Western parlance, I interpret the call for democracy as a call for the domination of capitalist social relations and the extraordinary participatory democracy that allows Cuban people to actively be involved in the ter termination of their own living conditions as Arnold August has masterfully described in his books is not what Western elites have in mind when they call for democracy in Cuba. So what can we do in closing? Uh, we in the Western world, not only for the Cuban revolution, but also for ourselves, because I think that our collective hope for human emancipation also hinges on the survival of the Cuban political project and legacy. So let me propose that we can draw inspiration from the preamble of the Cuban constitution that was updated in 2019. Very, very briefly, we the people of Cuba, they say, inspired by the heroism of those who fought for a free, sovereign, democratic homeland of social justice and human solidarity, the indigenous people who resisted submission, the slaves that rebelled against their masters, by those who fought against unemployment, exploitation, and against other social evils, and those who promoted, participated in, and developed the first organizations of laborers, farm workers, and students, we, the people of Cuba, committed that Cuba will never return to capitalism as a regime sustained by the exploitation of man by man. We declare a will that the law of the laws of the Republic be presided by the profound yearning of Jose Martí. I wish that the first law of our Republic be the devotion of the Cubans to the full dignity of man or by briefly paraphrasing Che Guevara, let us be realistic, let us do the impossible. So let us Cuba live and let us support the dream of revolution for them and for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, and our final speaker today is Claude Morin. Claude is a retired professor from the history department at the Université de Montréal, where he taught for more than three decades. Uh, Claude has a doctorate from the University of Paris 10, uh, and he, his main research fields have been in Latin America, colonial Mexico, then Cuba, the Caribbean and Central America in the 20th century. He's written or edited six books in some, and some 40 articles and chapters in collective works. And he has commented on and he still comments actively on, the, on Latin American news in the print and electronic media and has led groups and cultural trips to Latin America. And I should say that Claude um, will, after the presentations, Claude will certainly be able to field questions in French if anybody feels more comfortable that way. Okay, Claude, please go ahead. Hello, Wendy, thank you. Yes. And hello, folks. Uh, although I'm francophone, I will speak today in English, a language uh, I've not been speaking for a while. So I apologize for mistakes, both phonetic and uh, linguistic. Okay, I'll start with a tidbit of uh, information that has strong symbolic uh, value. Uh, last Saturday, uh, President, the President of Mexico, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, speaking in a ceremony uh, for the, the 238th uh, anniversary of Simons Bolivar birth with uh, uh, chancellors and diplomats of 33 uh, nations uh, attending in Mexico, said that Cuba was an example, a model of resistance to US hegemony in defense of its sovereignty for 62 years. Cuba should deserve in its mind a uh, Premio de Dignidad, the Dignity Award. Uh, and he concluded by saying that Cuba is una nueva numancia, a new nomancia. That Celti Iberian settlement uh, north of where is Madrid now resisted for more than 20 years to Romans, uh, Roman attacks and aggression. It, and at the end, uh, instead of surrendering, its inhabitants burned their settlement and most committed suicide. And for that reason, uh, Obres Obrador uh, said that Cuba should be declared mankind heritage. Uh, but uh, we will all agree that uh, 
Cuba should not experience that fate. Cuba must survive and live on. And let Cuba live is the, the new uh, motto. We are all united in defending Cuba. Now I will talk about what have been proposed uh, as themes. And the first theme is uh, health. One of the most impressive feat in 19, in 20, 20, uh, 20 and 2021 20, has been the deployment of more than 50 Cuban medical brigades to fight the pandemic in the 50 countries and territories. Uh, the Henry Reeve uh, Brigades, as they are called, was, were created in 2005 as a response to uh, Hurricane Katrina that uh, struck uh, so, uh, Southeast uh, United States and Louisiana especially. Uh, Henry Reeve was a young American soldier who volunteered to fight along with Cuban patriots seeking liber the liberation from the Spanish colonialism. And he died in action in 1876. It's very symbolic that Fidel proposed that name to uh, identify the, uh, in, uh, the International Medical Brigade that he proposed in that year. In, 50 year, in 15 years, 20 brigades fought natural disasters all over the planet, and other brigades fought cholera in, um, in Haiti in 2010, and also Ebola in Africa in, nine, in 2014. In 2020 and 2021, more than 3,500 uh, health professionals carried out missions abroad, treating thousands and thousands of patients and saving as many lives. Most countries, most countries paid, if they could, only for transportation and upkeep. That's a big feat also, because the salaries of Cuban workers were paid by the Ministry of Public Health. And this is, that means that Cuban uh, uh, carried the, the cost of having its professional uh, uh, doing work, salvaging, uh, salvaging uh, people uh, in these 50 countries. We should all know that the Cuban Medical Brigades and Reeves have been nominated to get by co committees all, uh, all over the planet to get the Peace Nobel Prize next fall. Medical internationalism has been a practice for mo almost 60 years and in spite, in spite of be uh, Cuba being blockaded. Over decades, more than 400,000 healthcare workers have worked in 160 countries. In 1999, Cuba began to train foreign doctors at its Latin American School of Medicine, ELAM, Escuela Latinoamericana de Medicina, which so far graduated more than 30,000 doctors and uh, nurses uh, from more than 115 countries. All these graduates trained free of charge in Cuba were candidates selected by their country of origin. And upon graduation, they should return to their countries to work in a poor uh, suburbs, in poor uh, villages, uh, app applying the principles of um, uh, social medicine that they have been taught in Cuba. Um, there's a topic also that I wanted to raise, terrorism. Uh, Donald Trump, just before leaving office, put Cuba back on the list of countries that support terrorism. It was one of the most severe sanctions because it carries many consequences, 
mostly for financial transactions between banks all over the world. It is a lie. It is a slander. Cuba has been the target of terrorist actions since 1960, when a ship, La Cuba, carrying arms, exploded in the La Habana Harbor with a toll of 70 dead and 200 injured. In 60 years, more than 3,500 Cubans were killed and 2,000 handicapped in terrorist actions carried out in Cuba, but sponsored, planned, and paid for in the US. So Cuba has been a victim, not a sponsor of terrorism. This is the a big lie, and this is part of sanctions because of the impact that this uh, inclusions of Cuba on the list as for its uh, uh, economic relations and financial relations. Now, uh, I was invited to talk about uh, the alliances that Cuba has with some countries that are very significant for uh, its survival. Cuba is and has been Russia's strategic ally. We can say that the revolution will not have survived without the military umbrella that uh, uh, so the Soviet Union provided in the 60s and 70s, and the economic assistance that they also the Soviet Union and other uh, Eastern countries uh, provided to Cuba up to 1990s. Now, in the economic sphere, uh, Russia provides equipment for improving transportations, like locomotives, uh, parts for trucks and cars, setting assembly shops for vehicles. Russia should provide also airplanes with their crew, so to ramp up international tourism, because Cuba cannot lease Cuba and Cubana, the national company, uh, air uh, uh, line, cannot lease planes from the Western air companies to operate its uh, Cubana flights. In, nine, in 2019, Cuba approved a line of credit of 38 million euros to support sustainable development in the area of defense. So the, the Russia still uh, assists Cuba in some of its needs in terms of uh, military defense. Uh, recently, a few days ago, Russia has just delivered uh, 88 tons of medical supplies in two military flights to Havana. I can also say that China has made significant investment in Cuban renewable energy projects. It has sold on the favorable terms, buses, railway engines, and carriages. It offers also to integrate Cuba in the silk and road, uh, silk road and belt that uh, is, it is building. Uh, both Russia and China support Cuba in defending its national sovereignty and its path to development in line with its own conditions. And a new uh, ally is also iron. Uh, cooperation with iron includes transfer of technology for the production of uh, the Soberana DOS vaccine against COVID-19. And this cooperation will be done between the Pasteur Institute of Iran uh, and the Finley Institute in, of Cuba and will produce more than 3 million doses each month. And both countries uh, are united facing US sanctions uh, as I can as I may remember, uh, recall. There's also another ally. It is Venezuela. In 
2000, Cuba and Venezuela brokered a convenio integral de cooperation. Venezuela will sell oil in exchange for services of Cuban professionals like doctors, teachers, and some military personnel. By 2015, Cuba was satisfying about 60% Venezuela was satisfying about 60% of Cuba oil needs, sending on average 100,000 uh, barrels a day. So, but the delivery of oil has fallen dramatically because of the crisis in Venezuela and Trump sanctions, which targeted fuel delivery by Venezuela tankers all over the world and also to Cuba. So that's about what I was uh, in, uh, I had intended to say in this talk. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Claude. And thanks to all for really great presentations. As you can see in the chat, uh, they are all being really appreciated. Uh, so now um, I would like to open up for questions. Yuri, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Desai. Uh, my question, uh, the, a, a, anyone of the panel can, uh, can answer it, but, uh, but, but I'd like to put it uh, to, uh, to uh, Mr. August. I wanted to know uh, what role have, uh, have expat communities played in trying to destabilize the islands of Cuba? And, uh, are, and have there been, uh, is, is there any, left-wing group in Cuba that would like that that would like political reforms but still but still conserve the socialist system or 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 is or or is the entire uh, opposition that we're seeing in Cuba all uh western backed uh right wingers uh great thank you Yuri uh, Benjamin please go ahead Uh, Benjamin, uh, you are muted, Benjamin. Okay. Uh, Wendy, uh, you've been commuting to Cuba for the last many years. And um, I was in Cuba in the 90s um, with a project about pianos. And um, I noticed tremendous solidarity among the um, among the, the people that were just being crushed, which should have, who should have been crushed by the special period, but they were, they had a certain spirit, which I'd never seen before in my life. Is that spirit gonna get tired eventually? Because they've been through so long and now they've had this new, this new horrible period. Uh, okay, thank you, Benjamin and David, please go ahead. Okay. They say that socialism kind of doesn't work because it's an example of uh, Cuba. And plus, people in Western capitalist countries, if you're poor and have a disability, you have a disadvantage. They don't help you. I have a disability and I've been discriminated against, you know? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, can we have an initial round of answers to this question and uh, then we'll go to another round of questions if there are any. I think you've really stunned everybody. So, uh, Wendy, please go ahead. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I, there was a great expression uh, in Cuba, si se puede. Si se puede is over everything. Uh, yes, we can. And that, that belief in that spirit, you're quite right. Uh, <clears throat> it was Benjamin who made the who made the comment, um, it was that, yes, we can get through this spirit that got them through the special period. One of the difficulties right now, of course, is um, those people who lived through the Batista years and who um, lived through the revolution and supported the revolution are getting older. And um, the younger uh, Cubans, although they're very well educated by their school system, haven't had that direct experience. And so um, with the advent of tourism and the people coming into the country with bling and with technology and all these things, um, I think it is um, the, the challenges to ensure that um, that spirit of the revolution is kept alive 
across age groups and in the younger people. The US has been very strategic and clever in targeting hip hop community for, uh, to foment uh, dissension. They're, they're uh, putting money in the pockets of hip hop artists who then appeal to the youth and appeal to the music community to try and, and foment dissent. Um, but uh, the, the Cubans I speak to certainly, they're frustrated. They're frustrated by this, this triple witching hour of embargo and Trump and COVID. But um, the Cubans I speak to understand that this is not the problem of their country. It's an external problem being foisted on them. Okay, any of the other panelists would like to respond? Arnold, you should unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Um... Yeah, okay. I, I'd like to respond to. Uh, you can hear me? Uh, respond to. Let me. Can I? Can you wait for Keith to finish? Oh, sure, go ahead. Keith, please yeah, go. I, I just want to uh, support Wendy's comments. I, I think the vast majority of Cubans want improvement within the system and individual economic improvement. Um, but they also understand the difficulties they face under the blockade. Even, even the uh, majority of the dissidents say, end the blockade, and then let's see the Cuban government uh, stand. And uh, I'm going to shut off my video just in case. The, the, and, and let's see how the Cuban government stands without the blockade. Uh, the thing I've never understood is the, the Americans, you know, use, say the Cubans use the blockade as an excuse for all their problems. Well, then end the blockade and see, and see if those excuses still continue. Um, th there's definitely a generational uh, aspect to this. The first generation revolution, revolutionary won the social justice programs. The current generation accepts them and, and doesn't really recognize the accomplishments in the same capacity as the first generation did, uh, but uh, just to emphasize, I really do believe the vast majority of Cubans want to improve their situation, want to improve the government, uh, uh, improve uh, extensions, and, and, they work, and they want to work with it under the current system. Um, and I think that's a really important point to, 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 to emphasize. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, Arnold, please go. Yes, ahead. I would like to uh, respond to Yuri Singh that he addressed uh, it specifically to me. Good question. Rather, the role of the expats in countries such as uh, Cuba and Canada. Uh, the, the expats in these countries, you one cannot say it is a homogenous group. For example, in the United States, the very sharp conflict between, on the one hand, the thousands of expat Cubans and their allies working in the United States to raise the issue of the blockade right into the public space and putting pressure on the Biden administration to lift the blockade against Cuba. I guess the most uh, glaring example of this work was how the expats and their allies had a full page ad in the New York Times two days ago demanding that Biden lift the blockade against Cuba. Now, uh, the, those who oppose that, their very, their position, Miami based position is simply to support the uh, blockade and even to heart, uh, intensify the blockade against uh, Q, but of course, the mainstream media, they only hear not the expats who are patriotic, support the sovereignty of Cuba, but only those expats that agree to the American position of increasing the blockade against Cuba. The second question that um, uh, Yuri asked, I think is very important, it's very complicated. Uh, you know, and, and the question, if I remember correctly, was that what about you know left opposition within Cuba? Okay, now in Cuba, for I gave examples of people who provide their view. For example, the view of the uh, 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 of the person who was uh, an expert in social media. I quoted extensively from Fabian Escalante. I also quoted from uh, a friend of mine who had a different view on Escalante, but still 
uh, has his position against US interference in Cuba. I could give you many other examples. Uh, 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 Contrary, contrary to what is said about Cuba, that it's a great place, there's no discussion, there's no debate. This is false. Just in my presentation of 40 minutes, I show there are different opinions on how to uh, deal with the question of Cuba. But these people that I quote, and many others, they are never quoted in the mainstream media. The mainstream media, NBC, CBC, they have their go-to people. And who are the go-to people? The, the, the ones in Cuba and outside of Cuba who uh, say they always support, you know, we are against the blockade, but we have to have a multi-party system, but we have to have capitalism in Cuba. But these people, they are continuously quoted in the mainstream media, while the those uh, Cuban patriots who are interested in, in having a, 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 an objective analysis of what to do, they are completely blocked out by the mainstream media. Thank you, Arnold. I want to add something. Uh, sorry, who is this? Yeah, Claudia. Yes, of course, Claudia. Please go. Yeah. yeah, well, so someone, uh, uh, someone was asking about the opposition being external. I always like to compare, you know. person has died. Uh, I, I always like to compare. Like, so, so let, let's take Canada, right? Are people in Canada opposed to things that the government of Canada does or even the government itself? Well, the answer is yes, but you wouldn't see, say, you know, a demonstration. I'm living in the sort of north of you know, Toronto at the moment, Peterborough. There's every Friday a demonstration against something. And nobody comes from the media with their camera saying, hey, they want to overthrow the, the Trudeau regime, right? Overthrow capitalism. Now, I'm sure that a lot of people uh, say myself included, uh, you know, would like to overthrow the regime and overthrow capitalism. I mean, you don't, you don't put it in those terms, right? So that's part of this hybrid warfare. That's part of this uh, uh, manufactured uh, propaganda to essentially, uh, you know, throw out anything that opposes uh, the so-called sort of Western democracy, et cetera, which is, is again, you know, a code, a code word for capitalist social relationships. So there is a lot of this, you know, there is a lot of uh, debate, you know, and in Cuba, you can strike conversations with people in the street. People will actually allow you into their house. I've knocked, like literally knocked on people's doors and say, hey, you know, I somebody told me that there is a consultorio here. I remember like once I wanted to see, you know, a local consultorio, which is essentially, you know, the medical, I was interested in the medical stuff, you know, the medical um, uh, uh, people that you have uh, seeing uh, seeing folks in, you know, pretty much every every neighborhood, several ones. And we struck a conversation with a the doctor. They're very, you know, laid back. I'm not a cantina. I have the right accent, I suppose. They allowed me in. We started, you know, talking. And, you know, people are very open. Even those who say, hey, you know, the government uh, sucks. I'm, I'm making it up, right? But, you know, they're unhappy and so on. They tell you without even knowing you in the middle of the street. So in addition to that, you know, knowing the, 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 the strategy and the techniques of hybrid warfare, uh, and if you visit Cuba enough, and why, for instance, Americans are not allowed to go freely, right? If it's such a crappy place and such a terrible place where, you know, where, you know, where people are oppressed, and so why don't they allow Americans to fly in freely so that they can see for themselves uh, and, and so on, right? The same as Keith was, you know, just saying, well, lift the blockade and see, you know, how bad the government can be. So none of the None of the arguments, none of the excuses really stands close scrutiny when you begin to look into them. And actually, when you run some comparisons with other cases you may have in mind. So that's what I wanted to say about the actually the, you know, the only external opposition. Of course, it isn't only external, but that's true, like in any country in the world, even in the most, you know, sort of, you know, the really horrific ones, right? Uh, there was another one on the, on, the, on the getting tired of the support. And in my opinion, uh, it is hard if you live, you know, year after year, decade after decade, things get uncomfortable. Uh, Cubans have a great tolerance for discomfort, but, you know, imagine yourself, you know, there's only so much that you can tolerate. And if it's your grandmother telling you the stories of the revolution is one thing, if you yourself live through it is a different one. And I remember talking to the, uh, the, the head of the, the, the director of the, um, the museum, of the, the literacy museum, uh, you know, an older woman, I mean, not old, but you know, not, not well launched into adulthood. 
uh, who said, you know, uh, you know, I, I was born before the revolution. She told me in a, in a, in a just in a informal conversation, and 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 she had a couple of master's degrees, and she was black, and she said, look, you know, people like me would have never. I mean, you know, we would be, you know, I would still be. Uh, you know, either a slave or indentured server or something, had it not been for the revolution, the revolution gave me everything I have. And you find person after person just, you know, walking the streets of throughout the country who will tell you similar stories. There's only so much, however, that anyone, you know, sort of can do to, to keep that memory alive when the crushing from outside is, is, is so terrible, in, in my opinion. So. I hope that addresses partly the, you know, the concern of the, the person in the audience. Thank you, Claudia. I have one more round of questions. So I have Cliff Durand and then Jorge, uh, and then I have a question. So Cliff, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I have Cliff Durand on the land of the Otomi people in central Mexico. Um, Speaking of hybrid warfare, we saw an early example of that back in 1954 when the CIA and uh, British intelligence overthrew uh, the Mossadegh government in Iran. A uh, very successful effort uh, to use propaganda to destabilize a government. Um, now, um, Arnold has pointed to how now the social media amplifies the ability to destabilize situations and to mobilize people to um, express opposition um, by magnifying it beyond you know, all proportion. Um, now, that social media campaign, which uh, I thought was very well described and very well documented in the article um, that Arnold referred to, um, can take root only if there's some dissatisfaction. And the reality in Cuba, from what I can tell, is that the hardship uh, in daily life is so severe and people not wanting to go through another special period, one was enough. Um, so that that provided fertile soil to mobilize people in what numbers we don't really know uh, to express protest. One of the questions that I have, and I guess this is probably for Wendy as much as anyone else, but also for Arnold, um, is what if the lineamentos adopted 10 years ago had really been implemented and opened the way to the expansion of cooperatives, urban cooperatives in particular, would that have provided an expanding economic opportunity, an opportunity for young people in particular to, um, to initiate uh, action and change the uh, quality of their life? Would that have uh, lessened the impact of this new special period and have helped to maintain a um, social morale uh, and commitment to a socialist Cuba? Um, thank you, uh, uh, Cliff. And uh, Jorge Para, please go ahead. Okay, well, uh, he sent me an email, uh, sorry, sent me a chat message saying he wanted to ask a question, but maybe he's gone. Um, all right, so when I, I had a, a quick question. I mean, uh, you know, one, basically I just wanted to ask all the panelists, uh, thank them all for their fantastic presentations, really informative. And I just wanted to ask them really, what is it, you know, you've, 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 you've thought about these questions for so many decades. What do you think at this point it is necessary to do in order to stop these sanctions, or at least lessen them in any way. So if, if any kind of a, um, action you feel we need to do, either on the media front, um, you know, sign petitions, do anything else, social media front, etc. If you can please reflect on that a little bit, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, so who would like to go first? Um, 
Wendy, please. Well, I'll just respond to Cliff's uh, comment. Yeah, thanks for, for bringing that up, Cliff. Um, so Los Linimientos opened the door for uh, cooperatives in the non-agro sector. Uh, of course, co-ops produce the majority of food in Cuba, uh, and they still do today. They are the most important contributor to food security, are Cuba's cooperatives. But the opening of lineamientos to non-agricultural cooperatives, there were a number of them formed, as I know you know, Cliff. Um, I've brought um, uh, some international uh, delegations down to meet with these um, cooperatives. The um, One of the special um, aspects of the cooperatives is if you are a cooperative, you then can um, borrow money from the bank and uh, to finance yourself. A lot of um, people saw the um, opportunity for cooperatives as as uh, oh this is this is the way to 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 um, to move forward. And they were flooded. I think there were something like four or five hundred applications that came in. Um, almost overnight. And they were also in the process of putting together a new cooperative law. And um, in, in fact, uh, it, it's one thing to say you want to form a cooperative, but you need the infrastructure, you need the intellectual uh, or the, the educational grounding and a lot of support to do that. So Cuba pulled back and said, okay, we've got to instead of doing this wrong, we want to do it right. And we want to move forward with that uh, grounding. And then of course, um, things started to get worse and worse and worse with Trump. Um, I think that, you know, as, as, as disaster capitalism disintegrates around the world, and in particular, I mean, it's so ridiculous for Biden to call Cuba a failed state. <laughs> that's, that is ironic. Um, as we see the impact of, of capitalism on communities, on inner cities, and, and um, the, the devastation that it's caused, um, we, we really need this cooperative socialism offers a whole new model. And um, I think it's, it's one of the reasons we need to look to Cuba so strongly. I, I agree with you, Cliff, and what you said about the cooperatives, and, and I and others have been trying to um, help Cuba as it walks this important walk. I, I'd like, also like to respond briefly to Cliff because he addressed it to me as well as to uh, Wendy. One specific point is important. Cliff asked an important question. If some of the uh, uh, orientations adopted democratically by virtually the entire population in Cuba with regards to various reforms, especially, for example, to increase the uh, weight of cooperatives in Cuba and other such measures. Now, perhaps this was what Escalante was referring to in his quite you know, fiery statement where he said, look, we have to look at our own our own mistakes. And he mentioned specifically, I don't know if he had this specific policy in mind with regards to cooperatives, but he said in general, it was our own mistake in being late in applying, in applying decisions that were taking, taken, uh, taken a long time ago. So I guess he gives substance to what you're saying, but this is an ongoing debate. We're just seeing the beginning of a major debate that is taking place. Uh, in, in, in Cuba. And uh, that's all I have to say on that, uh, Cliff. I hope it answers your question. Okay, great. Um, any other panelists would like to say? Oh, Claudia, please go ahead. Uh, you're muted. Claudia, it's you're also, Yeah, yeah, thanks. It's, it's, you know, it's an important point. Uh, but I, you know, I, this is my sort of reaction. I always, uh, you know, think about, you know, what should Cuba do or what could it do better or what we could do to support Cuba. But my, you know, as I study sanctions, uh, you know, sanctions are, are sort of strangled people, countries, systems, everyone. It's like having someone grabbing your neck and tightening their grip, you know, strong grip around your neck and say, well, what can you do to breathe uh, normally in the meantime? What, what, what would be the strategy? So, no matter what, <laughs> the, the, the only thing they will go for is, uh, you know, the complete abandonment of the revolution that they, they meaning, you know, the imperialists, the capitalists, the, 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 the Americans and, and all the so-called allies, Canada, unfortunately included and so many others. So uh, while it is a good thing, you know, to look at, you know, how can Cuba improve, you know, whatever features of, 
you know, socialism, et cetera. And, and, and definitely, you know, cooperatives are fantastic and all the, you know, the, uh, uh, the los lineamientos and all that is just wonderful. We can write books. The, you know, the issue of sanctions, they need to be stopped and there's no like targeted sanctions less. Of course, there is less sanctions, right? I'm not, I, I don't want to say that it doesn't make any difference, but they have to sort of end in the same way that we wouldn't say, you know, let's accept torture and see how we can kind of work around torture so that people can still have, you know, good health, a good life, et cetera. That's, that's the basic point, I think, that people in the world, in the West, those of us who are responsible for it, because it is our governments that either actively promote or at least, you know, uh, are bystanders to this uh, tremendous criminality exerted on the Cuban people and so many other countries as well. So that's my uh, comment. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Wendy, please go. I, I would just, uh, because we're fortunate to have so many people on the call this morning, one in particular is Tom Webb. And uh, I'd love to give him a chance just to make a comment on the, uh, the, the discussion on cooperatives because he has been to Cuba several times to look at Cuba's co-op. So it might be useful just to have Tom weigh in and briefly. Oh, Tom, would you like to say something? He's turn, turn your mic on. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, just very briefly, uh, I, I was uh, enormously impressed with the cooperatives in Cuba and the, the, the way in which they uh, had a very con an amazing <coughs> consultation process in developing their cooperative laws. Uh, and I remember visiting a garment factory where <clears throat> that had been a state-run business. And, and uh, their, their proudest accomplishment, they told us, was they had reduced the price of student uniforms by 20%. Uh, and then they, questioning also turned out that they had increased their incomes of the workers by, uh, I, I don't remember the exact percentage, but I think it, it was significant, like 25, 30%. And then we asked them, well, how can you do both of those things? And they said, well, because we don't need managers now. We, we have very, very few managers. We manage ourselves and we help each other and we all work together and we're not working for some ball. And, and I think, you know, I was just very impressed that this kind of cooperative socialism where you have a democratically owned economy is something that we will need more and more as we move through disaster capitalism. Uh, as we watch the wildfires and the floods, and as we watch capitalism exacerbating all of these problems, the, the tremendous economic inequality between the very, very rich and the, and the, and the rest of the world, and there's a very small group of people. Uh, as we watch that unravel, and it will unravel because it can't simply survive. You cannot destroy the environment. You cannot destroy uh, society, human society, and expect to have a functioning economy. So it's, it's going to unravel. And what struck me about Cuba was the importance of cooperative socialism. This is something that the world needs to learn from. And I was so impressed with their courage, uh, with, their, with their openness. Uh, this is not a closed authoritarian uh, uh, society. You're much more likely to run into that in a G7 protest in Toronto than you are on the streets of Havana. So uh, that's, I, I'm sorry, that's probably enough. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think Mick, would you like to? Would you prefer to to pose your question yourself, Mick Dunford, if you're still here? Um, okay. Um, I just see a wall. Um, I mean, I find the, the presentation is fascinating and very interesting. We've been in the past few months, but we try to really see the. I was extremely disturbed, really, at the way in which um, 
Mississauga. Um, and and like being a Palestinian, uh, like we understand so much what's happening, like the role of the capitalist, the role, the role of the imperialism uh, uh, against Cuba. We understand so much the problem. Like uh, we compare what's happening in Gaza. Gaza has been uh, under blockade for 13 years, and the Gaza people, the Palestinian people, continue to prevail despite all the blockade. And I, I'd like to say that the Cuban people and the Cuban revolution will continue to prevail despite all what's been happening, despite all the aggression by uh, the imperialists, uh, 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 by the Americans, by the, the, the capitalist uh, um, uh, uh, system. Um, I, ju I just wanted to, to mention when you were talking about the role of the media and the media and the media and the media, we know very oh, well yeah. that, that the media is always... We know very well that the media is always complicit when it comes to Palestine, when it comes to Israel's uh, aggression and Israel's uh, 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 settler colonial uh, roles and behind it, of course, the, uh, the, the bigger picture of the uh, imperialist settler colonial uh, uh, um, uh, role in the, in the whole region. Uh, we know very well that the media is complicit and is participating in all this. So, and the same thing, what we see in Cuba is the same. And that's why we can't count on the on the Western media, on the media that is very complicit. We need to find ways. It's important to find ways to reach people. It's so important. So I, like, I'd, I'd, like to, uh, I, I'd like to think of a broader picture. What can we do behind just uh, saying like the media is complicit. We need to do something. I don't know, alternative media. We need to do something behind that. It's 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 it, as I said. It's we we see the pain of what's happening in Palestine and the complicity of the media that does not show exactly what's happening in Palestine, and what we see now in Cuba. Like it's like we as as I said, the Palestinian people. We totally under the like the 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 Cuban revolution has been all along a major supporter of the Palestinian people, and we see what's happening in Cuba, in Cuba now. I, I, just, I just wanted to share a bit of my points and I, I, I don't know, I feel like we need to find uh, alternative ways um, uh, bigger than just uh, 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 regarding the media and the complicity. We know that the media is not gonna do anything. We need to do something beyond that. Thank you. And again, thank you so much for a great discussion, great analysis. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nadia, for that very powerful statement. And I should just like to say that just a couple of weeks ago, we organized a panel on Palestine and also how, how Palestine has been an inspiration for liberation struggles around the world. Uh, Mick, would you like to pose your question now? Uh, you are still muted. I didn't expect to ask any questions because I learned an enormous amount about uh, part of the world about which I know very little, but um, I was very, very concerned, you know, th this issue of um, internet insecurity and the way in which, you know, external intervention, in in external information war can in fact destabilize um, a part of the world such as, such as Cuba. And I, I just wondered what the panelists thought one should do in terms of managing this problem, and I, I asked that question in part in the light of the fact that in China there is a great firewall. 
which in fact is designed to address, you know, to some extent precisely this kind of problem. Although in the, in the case of China, of course, you're dealing with a country with one fifth of the world's population with a, a very distinctive language and a very difficult to learn language. Uh, thanks, Mick. Okay, so who would like to respond to these points? Um, anyone? Any of the panelists? Uh, Ken, would you like to ask a question? No. Okay, panelists, anyone would like to respond? Yeah, uh, really, I, I think the, the, it's a really good point. Social media can work both ways. It's, it's, used, it's being used now to destabilize Cuba. It can be used to get the Cuban voice out and the truth of, the, of, of Cuba as well. Uh, so unfortunately, it, it seems all one-sided, but I think it's important also to use social media, and maybe Arnold can address this as well, to get the, to get the Cuban voice out directly or through to the people like in this conference who know the truth about Cuba. Um, and the call for action connects with that. Sign the petitions. Uh, call your politicians, create groups. I mean, years ago, years ago, no one thought the Cuban Five would ever be free. And through an international movement, through an international recognition of small groups, it built. And, and now they're all living in, in Havana. I mean, the sanctions can be approached the same way. Um, the more voices on the other side, the, the, the more important it is. And social media can be a tool to get those voices heard. Um, I'd like to answer. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, on the issue of uh, alternative media that was raised by our friend, it's a very important point. You have alternative media, left alternative media in the United States. There are many examples. The Gray Zone, People's Dispatch, uh, Mint Press News, Code Pink, etc. They are very firmly on the Do side the of Cuba. Because there is a... Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, they are very firmly on the side of the Cuban people. Right now in Canada, let's see how things go. But at least we know yesterday, the Canada files, despite all the social democratic pressure, uh, did open publicity for this panel. So that is important to take it into account. With regards to um, you know, the, the alternative media, et cetera, and the use of uh, the social media, I think uh, with regards, to it, what is important? Yeah, petition. No. Pardon? Petitions are important. Uh, picket lines are important. But I think this webinar today is one more example that shows the importance of the battle of ideas. That is confronting head head on the dominant mainstream media. Uh, with regards to Cuba, that change could only come about by opposing the two-party system and replacing socialism with capitalism. But the sad part is the so-called so friends of Cuba who say they oppose the blockade are also in the front, uh, front lines of a, of a soft coup push against the Cuban government by either directly or indirecting directly uh, lobbying for a multi-party system, and we know what that means, and also for capitalism. And I think that this has to be dealt with as an important feature of the struggle over the ideas, on, struggle on ideas. Okay, thank you, Arnold. Sorry. I'd like to... Okay, last point, Mick brings up is so important because I, I think it was Fidel who said that the battle of the 21st century, the war, would be the, you know, the battle of ideas. And um, the, the, scene, or the scene is very, very complex, very, very difficult to handle. And I think that, you know, in my dark days, I think there's no, no hope, but probably the hope is in, in real... Uh, political education, like relentless political education, counteroffensive all the time. That's probably the only thing to counteract uh, and cancel out, uh, you know, this uh, hybrid warfare uh, political project. Uh, let me mention, for instance, it, and it's just the media. We say media, 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 but, you know, let me read you the headline of 
uh, the, the United Nations news alerts that I receive every week. UN rights chief, and that's Michelle Bachelet. She was a victim of the, the, of, of the Chilean military regime dictatorship, right? Michelle Bachelet, as you know, calls for prompt release of protesters held in Cuba. What, what did it take for the system to get this woman to say this? Uh, I just, I, I don't know, but uh, they, they managed to have her, uh, the, you know, victim of the Chilean dictatorship, say something like this, again, it's just to tarnish uh, the government of Cuba. Then uh, the NGO industrial complex. complex. So, yeah, people have so to a note, yeah, a, a notice of funding, a notice of funding opportunity offering $2 million for people who are committed to bring democracy to Cuba. And they put it in a format that you would receive in any university, right? So universities, we get flooded with these things from USAID. You know, they aren't so gonna that's a difficult one. So it's very, very difficult. And I think that political education is the only thing that can neutralize uh, this hybrid warfare. Thank you so much, Claudia. I think we should bring this to a close. I just wanted to say in closing a couple of things. Number one, I think that at one level, of course, it's very dismaying what's going on in, in uh, what the United States is trying to do to Cuba. At the same time, we should remember two things. Number one, as lots of speakers as well as people asking questions have noted, the current capitalist system is really beginning to disintegrate, unravel and not provide for ordinary people, even in the rich countries, the first world countries. And I think therefore, the, the kind of uh, critique criticisms that we are making are going to sound increasingly more credible and I think it's time for everyone to join the effort as I think somebody said I, uh, I forget who it was perhaps it was Keith anyway whoever it was you know, uh, sign petitions, join groups. If you don't have a group to join, create one. Um, contest what is being said in the media with your own writing. Uh, Arnold uh, uh, rattled off a whole bunch of alternative media websites. And let me remind you, the alternative media began emerging in the late 1990s. It's already nearly 30 years old because that's how long it's been since people began to realize that the stories in the mainstream media do not make sense. They do not add up. They do not, uh, you know, they're not relevant. So anyway, so we know that this has been happening. It's been a long time coming. And I think the pandemic is also really putting pressure on capitalism as well. So in this context, uh, I think if we do all these things, it will be more effective. And finally, I just like to say that if you like the sort of thing we were discussing today, if you like the perspectives that we are, we were uh, expressing today, please uh, a look out for uh, the new manifesto that will be launched by the International Manifesto Group, which many of us have been working on. Um, it will really try to express the kind of the current conjuncture and give, you know, give some ideas about what is to be done, etc. So please look out for that. So with that, uh, on behalf of the International Manifesto Group, I want to thank the speakers for their brilliant presentations. And I would like to say it's more than brilliant. I think they come out of a commitment to Cuba and to the left, which I think could be heard by everyone. And I, I would thank, thank you for everyone. Thank you to Arnold, especially for initiating this, because I think there has been a lot of backsliding on a lot of left groups. And I think such an event was very much needed. Um, this event will be available as a recording on the International Manifesto Group website. Uh, uh, which uh, you can read through the website of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group, which is simply geopolitical economy, all one word, dot org. With that, thank you again very much. Thanks for attending and uh, goodbye. <laughs>